Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. There is no telling what demons, snakes, and monsters live here in this grass. This is episode 86, recorded November 8th, 2020. Your host, Jeff Moore. On this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, and maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monster spirits, psychos, and villains that have haunted movie-going audiences since the dawn of film <sighs> history. With me this week are my incredible co-ghosts, Whitney Chiazzo, an accomplished artist, makeup artist, and writer. Whitney, how are you this fine weekend? I am good, and I am full because I had dinner, but I am ready. How are you guys? <laughs> excellent, excellent. Also with us is Chad Hunt, co-host on the Decades of Horror, the 1970s and 1980s, a film producer and director with Wreak Havoc Productions, and a comic book artist and writer, Chad. Jeff. How are you? <laughs> Well, I feel old on the outside, but young on the inside. So come try me. <laughs> I, I don't even know what you just said, but. <laughs> you will, Jeff. You will. Yeah, I'm afraid I'll learn later. Joseph Perry, <laughs> due to other commitments, is off for the rest of 2020. And we really do miss him. Uh, but that gives us an opportunity to include listener guest hosts for a few episodes. And our listener guest hosts. Uh, today is Nick Gadman, and I forgot to ask Nick how to introduce him, but we get lots of comments from Nick, and, and we really appreciate them. Uh, how, are you, how are you, Nick, and, and uh, maybe introduce yourself. Hi, Jeff. I'm, I'm, I'm groovy. I've been a fan of the podcast for about <laughs> six years, so it's exciting to be inside of the podcast, and for once, people are actually talking back to me when I, when I, when I talk to the podcast, so... <laughs> Yeah. It's great. It's great to be able to actually interact. Is Thank it you. is it just me or is it just I just love the way Nick said groovy. I love yes. it. Groovy yes. guys. It's groovy. That's the most awesome uh, thing. Uh, I've uh, I was thinking the Beatles for sure. I, yeah, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> actually, you know, I went through that same thing, uh, Nick, because uh, I used to uh I'd be driving around listening back in the early days of horror news radio and they'd be doing stuff the saint and i'd be screaming the answer you know or driving down the road going tell them about this tell them about don't forget this don't forget that actor you know so anyway i don't know if that's what you do or not but no that that's exactly it i walk down the street <laughs> and i think i think people think i've got such a you know a, a, a fun fulfilled life but i'm actually shouting at podcasts i'm not actually interacting <laughs> with anybody i'm not on the phone I'm not, I'm not a great businessman i'm not i'm not this wonderful person who's got all these great friends that i'm chatting to and on the phone all day every day i'm in the street <laughs> shouting at podcasts so, it's, so today the podcast is shouting back at me so it's it's, 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 a, it's a very strange experience <laughs> It's come first full circle. <laughs> it's come full circle. That's it. Yeah. Everybody's thinking, what an important guy. He's he's talking all the time on the phone. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so Nick, Nick picked this film. Our topic uh, this week is Ani Baba from 1964 from writer, director Kaneto Shindo. And it stars Nobuko Otowa, Jitsuko Yoshimura, and Kai Sato. Very basic synopsis of this, if, if you haven't seen this. Two women kill samurais and sell their belongings for a living. Yes, it's actually a way to make money. While one of them is having an affair with their neighbor, the other woman meets a mysterious samurai wearing a bizarre mask. All right, so this is 56 years old. And we're going to pretend like everybody's seen it. So if you want, maybe you should go watch it first if you don't want it to be spoiled. 
Uh, this comes from, and I don't know, I I feel like Doc here today. Uh, the production company is Kendai Aiga Kiyokai, also Tokyo Aiga Company Limited. But it was distributed by Toho, which is much easier to say. Hmm. Um, well, you pronounced that very well, Jeff, actually. Oh, did I? <laughs> yes, yes. I've heard it pronounced and you did that very well. Release date is was the 21st of November, 1964 in Japan and the 4th of February, 1964 in the U.S. And it didn't get to the U.K. until October 1966. Although I saw some information out that said it was cut in England when released in 1968. So I, I don't know why it was, how could it be released in 66 and 68? Video releases later were not cut. It's also known as, and we've got to get our requisite German title, Anibaba di Totorenen, which means the Slayer. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Maybe. that's yeah, it's a bit of a strange one, but kind of makes sense. But I think it lacks the subtlety of the um, of the story. I think the German ones are always strange ones, and that's why we read them. <laughs> They're always like one yeah. step weirder. Uh, Ani Baba, uh, maybe Whitney, would you like to say that one? Sure. The Omnito de Sexo. That's the the myth, the sex myth. Yeah, El Mito del Sexo. I like that one. It actually fits it pretty good because there's the two main characters, well, in this film are like sex and tall grass, I think. Um, and then La Femme Diabolique from Canada, which is the evil woman. And I had figured out how to pronounce this before, but I forgot now what it was. Anibaba Les Toises. Toises? Toises? Toises. Toises. Uh, Toises. Toises. The Killers. Ah. Yeah. Ah, so this, the was, French. this was shot in Japan. Uh, it started on uh, shooting started on June 30th, 1964 and continued for three months. According to Wikipedia, I have no information on the budget or domestic box office. We have one tagline and you need to read this, Chad, because there's only one. And, <laughs> yeah. Daphne's going to be so disappointed. There's only one. Oh. I know. I know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the most daring film import ever from Japan. <laughs> oh, God. Was that Mitch McConnell? No, that was. Yeah, oh, that's God. A- <laughs> that's he has the jaws for it. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. No politics on this podcast. I just had a flashback to John Stewart on The Daily Show. Uh, so let's go to first impressions. First time seeing this film and, and uh, you know, if you'd seen it before, how does it compare now? And uh, Nick, since this was your pick, are you uh, okay to go first? Certainly am, Jeff. Um, so this is, this is a weird one. Um, when I was approached to do this podcast, when you talk about the classic era of horror, I'm a big fan of The Haunting and Night of the Demon. And clearly, these are films that have been chosen before. Um, you know, you can't have a... They, they are immediate go-tos. And I've, I've never been on a podcast before. I've, I've reviewed movies in college and university or whatever. But when I was approached oh, to do yeah. this, some like 20, 30 years later, I thought... Um, what shall I do? And for some reason, I just decided to pluck a challenge out of the air. Bonnie Barbar is a film that is, there is, um, I don't think you could pick up a book about horror movies and not have imagery from this film in that book. And this, there is something, I mean, I think we'll talk about this later, but there, is, there are echoes of this film throughout horror history. And I had never seen this film. And for some reason, I was sat on the bus on the way home from work and I just out of the air, I just on Ibaba, I just plucked it out of the air and <laughs> I don't regret it. The only thing I regret about <laughs> picking this movie is that there is no Batman 66 connection. That's, that's the only regret <laughs> for everything else. This film has left, led me down the craziest rabbit hole ever. I, I, I watched it for the first time about four weeks ago and 
I, I don't know what I just put it on in the middle of the night. It was about it was quite late on, and I, I, I'd had a glass of wine. And I was I was half going to bed and I put this film on and half the way through this film, I was just glued to the TV. I couldn't believe what I was watching. There is so much going on in this film. There are layers and layers and layers to this film. It's like an onion. And th- 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 I think it's just, not only that, it's so ahead of its time. There are things going on in this film that you won't see for another 20 or 30 years. So my first impression, I was just completely blown away. And I think... I mean, people talk about Japanese cinema and you talk about, um, you, you're talking about Kurosawa, you know, uh, uh, that's the kind of the benchmark, but I can't, I cannot understand how I have not really heard Kaneto Shindo's name on the same le- level of Kurosawa. Cause to me, the way that this film is, is, is presented, the way it's written, the way it's shot, the way it's presented, and the, the execution and delivery, it's, 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 it's quite a masterpiece, in my opinion. And so, yeah, I, I saw this, I, I pulled it out of the air, plucked it randomly out of the air because it's supposed to be a masterpiece. And sometimes with these classic films, you can be disappointed. You can look at a classic film and it doesn't hold up. But to me, this film could have been shot yesterday. There are, there are a lot of elements to me that, in, in the, the the physical execution and the technology, the, the technology of the film and the way the craftsmanship that is put in this film, it feels like it was shot yesterday, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah, I I uh, I'm glad you picked it as well. Uh, Whitney, how about you? What when was the first time you saw this, and what are your first impressions? Oh wow, uh, this is the first time I've seen this film. I watched it last week (laughs) and i just i okay when i think of japanese films it's i'm i'm very much a child when i think of japanese filmmaking or films because i i i like um anime and i think of ghibli films (laughs) not so i don't watch a lot of um (laughs) other japanese films but i as as far as horror i i I think the only horror film that I've really watched was Audition. And I it dawned on me, I've never seen anything of this era or even further or even back in the horror genre. But this one, this one is very dramatic. And Nick is right that this has elements to it that could be taken for a film for today because there were things that I was actually surprised to see for this kind of classic I, I don't know. I, I I guess I'll just go ahead and say there's it surprised me to see the elements and the nudity and the dynamics between characters that have really shifted and come a long way in what we see in film today. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess we'll 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 talk a little bit more about it <laughs> soon. Yeah, I, I think just 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 to add, I think that's important. I think that's why we after after pulling this film out of nowhere on a on a random choice we thought it would be really interesting to get your point of view so you know sure. last week when 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 you weren't um when you weren't available to do the to do the podcast it was it was a no-go <laughs> i oh. think both both me and jeff were just like no we can't do this film we can't do this recording without whitney because i think it's really important to get whitney's point of view on this because oh. of the dynamics of the two main characters Yes. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the weight. And yes, I, I, I do have more to say, but I guess we'll get more into it. I get, let's, let's hear what Chad yes. has to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Hunt, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about Anibaba. Anibaba is a, a movie that um, I've heard about for years. And I'll be honest, it didn't seem like it was a, a, a story that I wanted to or I would I would seek out to watch, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was well aware of the 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 mask, you know the the demon mask, and because I've seen that same you know that same mask, you see that in a lot of things. Um, so I was always interested, but neither it was always a uh, thing of never having a, an opportunity to see it, and it, or, or it not being readily available to see. So it just kind of slipped through my radar, but I've had people tell me about it and everything. So I was kind of interested uh, 
I'm glad to, that Nick picked this movie because uh, it gave me an opportunity to kind of watch it and sit down and talk with you guys about it. But and this is the first time I've seen it. So, and I was going to say the exact same thing you guys said. It, this looks like it was shot yesterday. It, it's fresh. It's um, it still feels relevant in a way, except for the I guess the war aspect of it. it it's something that really got me. And I, I, as I was watching it um, and watching this relationship develop uh, between this mother-in-law and, and daughter-in-law and the dependency that they had on each other and what one was willing to do to not let that dependency go was very intriguing to watch. The lengths that she would go to and the lengths that both of them went to, they were sort of like these highwaymen of, you know, where they would mm. just r- rob you know, rob these guys that sort of wandered around and came within close proximity to them. And that was, to me, that was an interesting idea too, that I I like to see unfold there. And just the way this movie is shot, the black and white is just stunning. And you guys know, I'm always looking for the supernatural aspect of everything Ah, or or who, or who the monster is. But it was a pleasant surprise that the supernatural aspect really didn't come into play until almost the very end of the movie but you're so invested in these characters it didn't really bother me um that much but boy when it came it really came the supernatural part just a well shot well even well acted and and yeah i know we're going to talk about there i mean there's a lot of, of nudity in this movie but it it was not gratuitous. It was, it felt very natural and very um, like, this is what would really be happening. You know, it didn't, you know, so it did, that didn't bother me. But when the horror aspect started to kick in, it got, it got really, really good uh, to me. So yeah, if I, my first impression is this is a wonderful movie and I, I wish uh, it may, it's making me want to watch it. I will watch it again and seek out more of, of his films as well, because it, it's just, uh, it really put an, it did put an impression on me, uh, how good it was. So, uh, I'm glad, 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 Nick, that you picked this and I'm glad we're going to talk about it. Amazing. I, f- I find it interesting, a different European versus, um, U S sensibilities where, you're worried about the the nudity, <laughs> and in the UK, we in Europe, we're often more worried about yeah. the violence. Well, I don't, it, I don't, I don't worry about it so much. It's just we watch a lot of movies, especially on the '70s podcast and stuff like that, where yeah. nudity usually misogyny is not far behind the nudity. Yeah, you, you know no. what I mean. And the nudity, yeah. Doesn't, yeah, and and that's what I was afraid of at first, but it didn't go that way. I'm, I'm being a bit playful. I'm, I'm being a bit funny, but th- there is a, there is an, an interesting thing. If you want to get into film censorship, th- there is an interesting um, dichotomy between US and European viewing habits. Where in in Europe, nudity or sexuality or love or that kind of thing is is tended to tends to pass censors a lot easier than violence, and in it, it, mm-hmm. it, from from a, from from a perspective, from a European perspective, a lot of um, a lot of the films that pass the US censor board. I mean, I, we, we can talk all day yeah. about about yeah. censorship, but but there is there is um, sure. you, you know, the, the violence and that violence is something that passes US censors a lot easier than will pass a European censor, right. and like I said, you know, and vice versa, which I, I find it is it's interesting, but it's a cultural thing. Yeah, it's the opposite here. Violence, you can show guys getting their head blown off all all right. day long, and it's no big right. deal. You show yeah. a breast or some naked body part, or and people just go uh, insane over it. And it, it's so yeah, that's a weird dichotomy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The and I was thinking that as I watched it, I thought uh, there's there's way more nudity in this than any American film I can think of for that time period. And I, I, I may well be wrong there, but just off the top of my head. But like Chad said, it's very matter of fact. It's it's just every day. It's it's 
makes sense, right? It's hot and slimy and they're living in these areas that, you know, they're surrounded by this tall grass. They're not going to have any breeze coming through. Yeah. And it's so, just them. They're out by themselves. They don't right, really, right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is the first time I saw this, too. Uh, and I, I, too, have had this. This has been something that's kind of been on my list or in the back of my mind to watch. I've had it. I've had it uh, DVR'd many times and never watched it and then i got rid of uh direct tv a few months ago and there it went you know i ended up going to criterion to get the it's actually not on blu-ray i don't believe unless it was out and i just got the dvd but but it's still it looks stunning um mm. so yeah i was impressed with this and especially right off the bat i loved the opening music those drum cadences that uh i just loved that i thought that was great and then the two characters, the uh, the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, that was an interesting relationship, which seemed to be sort of, you know, sort of settled into an almost uh, wordless existence. You know, they went about their business. They didn't talk that much. They just took care of it and did it. And and it is interesting that their job <laughs> was uh, to kill soldiers that were sort of astray from the rest of the uh, the rest of the troops, I guess, just to give a, a little bit about the story in that it's set in uh, 14th century and there was uh, a big war going on and they're not apparently not too far from Kyoto. And uh, at some point, the uh, the war breaks up into basically it's sort of a, you know, what we would think of as a feudal thing or, or between fiefdoms or warlords. Mm -hmm. And they're off the path of the war. And they're living in this, uh, you know, near to this body of water or river. And there's this like eight foot tall grass everywhere, everywhere. Um, you can't see through it. You can't see any distance. And these two women are living in this uh, sort of a, I don't know what it, I'd yeah. call it, like a thatched hut or lean to mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know, they sort of made a tent out of uh uh, branches and covered it with the the grasses and and then there's somebody that you know when they kill some soldiers they can take their loot to them and and trade it for food for a millet so yeah it's it's a, a very interesting relationship and one of their neighbors i guess comes home and he was a friend of the woman's son or the daughter-in-law's husband and uh, tells them how the son died in this battle and very soon on, he's uh, kind of, you know, working on the daughter. And actually, you know, in this uh, film, they don't have any names. The, the guy's name is Hachi, but the two women are just the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or the older woman and the young woman. You know, that's, that's it. So, yeah. And so they start having sort of a somewhat clandestine relationship. And, and it's just, it's... Uh, interesting how that kind of develops and the way that's acted out as an almost uh almost manic about it right it, at least you know the way they act when they're they're like sexually deprived or something there's that one scene where hachi is is writhing in the grass and screaming and stuff yeah and then uh when the young woman is is sneaking off to his hut in the night she's running breathlessly through the through the grass it's just interesting um so anyway i i'm just trying to set it up a little bit uh so mm -hmm. we said this was uh, uh directed and written by kaneto shindo and uh this guy is just i, I just thought he was masterful of this so what's what does anybody uh think of and i'll i'll just go to nick first so i want to make sure that all of the, all the things he found in the rabbit hole get surfaced here <laughs> what he thought of the writing and the directing on this film well the crazy thing about uh Kineto shindo is that he 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 passed away in 2012 age 100 right he was 100 yeah, years old yeah. and he he was in the middle of directing his last film his last, the last film he directed was Postcards, and he was age ninety eight. Oh so, so Clint Eastwood has got a little bit of catching up to do. 
And, and, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, look, you know, that's, that's crazy. Look, like this guy started 1930. He was he started out as an assistant, right? By 1940, yeah, he was yeah. writing scripts. In 1950, he was working with some really influential people in Japan, but because he could not get his vision on screen. He formed, he formed the Kindai Aiga Kaiokai production company to direct his own films. And this was like the first independent film studio in Japan. This is the birth of independent cinema in Japan. And he just grabbed the ball and went from there. His first feature, now here's where it gets interesting, Nabuko Ottawa, who plays the older woman. And I, uh-huh. I, 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 I can only refer to her as the older woman because... The performance from Nabucco Ottawa is one of the most bizarre and interesting and sublime performances I have seen in like 20 years of cinema. I think it's just amazing what she did. And she's only 40 when she does this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and more on that later. Now, he created his own film empire or went his own way, but it didn't really work out. I think his first film was... um, it was an autobiographical film about his life, story of a beloved wife. And, and for some reason, he, um, he, he met Nabucco Ottawa as um, the actress who played his, his wife. Um, but Nabucco Ottawa ended up becoming his mistress after this <laughs> film. It's, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, but not only was she his mistress, she was his muse because they went on to make films together for the next 30, 40, 30, 40 years. Uh, oh, wow. So it, now, you know, there, there was, he obviously wasn't, um, you know, it, 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 there was something going on in his life at the time. You know, we won't get into that. But him and Nabucco Ottawa formed this partnership that, you know, you, you see it for yourself in the film. But the ups and downs, he went running this um, production company for 10 years on his own book. And it, it wasn't working. Um, it really wasn't. It really wasn't working to a point. So he decided to go away. Um, he didn't want to deal with the with the with the typical standard or industry templates anymore. And he went away to an island. That he, he filmed a film on an island in 1961. And basically, his production company from 1950 to 1961 was pure debt. They were completely in debt. But they went away and made this film called Naked Island, and he stripped everything down to, like, a minimum of 15 a crew. And they went away on an island and decided to live the film. And they made the film The Naked Island in 1961. And it's basically a silent film. And it, and it, it, it just... It, the bottom line was this guy thought, right, my whole career is over. We've got no money. We've run the company into the ground. I can't do anything else other than just, just who cares? I'm going to go to an island and make this film. And he, he wins the Grand Prix at the second month Moscow International Film Festival. Oh. It, it pays off all the production companies' debts. And this is paves the way to Anibaba. So um, to try and cut a long story short, he films Anibaba in a similar way. He basically takes 20 to 30 cast and crew. They build the set in the, in, in the Suzuki fields in the Suzuki grass they make the living quarters and these basically everybody has to sign a contract to live yeah. this way for two to three months and if if, right. if they leave the set then they they don't get paid and he, 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 he forms this way of life and this form of cinema that is is never been done before he's a true pioneer in this way and, and I, I, I remember at the beginning Jeff um I didn't want to chime in where you were saying that there is no production budget that has gone on record and there is no box office budget. But I think he partnered with Toho to distribute the film. But the money that, that Shindo personally made off Onibaba financed his next four films. So that's a lot of money. Uh, yes, yes. I did see that too about the... Uh, he He wanted them to have a bond that they were... Because really, it was a, not a pleasant environment for filming. <laughs> Pretty much the way these people were living, they had set up gantries and and uh, you know things like that to uh, 
why, why, why am I, my mind's going blank. Um, you like structures you put together, like when you paint a house kind of thing, it looked like in some Scaffold. of the pictures, but scaffolds, that's what I was yeah. looking for, scaffolds. I mean, these people, these people are setting up camp, but they're doing something that I've never done before. This is a true pioneer. This is somebody who's got some serious creative vision. I found that fascinating. 230 writing credits. I mean, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> this guy was driven. Um, yeah. Like, like I said, he was, he was apparently on his deathbed. This guy was quoting on his, on his, on his hundredth birthday whilst he was dying. He was quoting scripts and scenes from his last movie. The guy just Jeez. went, yeah, he went until the end. I mean, and uh, yeah, and, 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 one thing that I did not look into that I really wish I would have looked into is apparently he did he did them um, a two thousand a film in two thousand which was um, a kind of semi biography of his life and apparently I can't remember the name of this film but apparently big swathes of this film are about the shooting of Oni Baba and it's like there there are, there are huge scenes of this film so that that would be interesting for me sorry I'm I'm thinking aloud but yeah yeah. So, uh, Chad and Whitney, how about you? What did you think of, uh, you know, had you looked up any information on uh, Kaneto Shindo or what did you think of the directing and the writing for this film? I'll let uh, uh, Whitney go first. Uh, I guess for me, I think for the writing, it was really something because of um, the, can, how do I say it? I guess I'll just spit it out. Uh, creating um, the tension with a codependent relationship of uh, two women and uh, having that tension. Uh, you, you, I didn't really realize it in, in the story and the writing at first, but it's something that, that took its course uh, within the nature. Uh, but, and I thought it itself with the surroundings and I thought it was a really nice way to see things um, develop. And e even with the direction, uh, I, I, Gosh, I don't know. It was just beautiful to see the atmosphere. And like you said, it was kind of grimy. And um, to see how things were just naturally playing out, it, like seeing the two um, really roughing it. And, and um, like this, some of the scenes where you're seeing where these two ladies are asleep. And then it just felt natural just to see two ladies kind of cohabitate. And even in the conditions and having to down dress and you see the sweat and the grime and everything in those conditions mm -hmm. and ju just directing how things probably w would have been for two ladies, just really roughing it and sticking it out and trying to survive in the atmosphere was, was definitely an eye opener for me. Yeah. But the direction was just, wow. It was, it was just a different kind of, take and going back in time and seeing how women together would survive and how would they play off of each other so that writing and just that atmosphere was was something else for me uh but as far as his the the, the writer and the director his work i'm not familiar with any of his work uh, this is the first time i've been introduced to any of it but i did see he had over like 300 credits of uh, stuff that he's worked on and that's that's a lot <laughs> yeah and always yeah chad how about you i thought this was just a masterpiece of direction what i've read of, of him his um early life and 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 some of his uh, childhood one of his sisters was a nurse who took care of like atom bomb victims and I also was reading too about how the effects of the mask he wanted, like when the mask is off and, and the face is distorted and, and disfigured, sort of he based that a little bit on that look of, of people who were disfigured by the, the, you know, Hiroshima and the atomic bomb. And so there was a lot of that in that in there that I, I really appreciated the characters themselves and the way he played these two women together, Hachi, that guy, he was really, I mean, you can say there's three characters in here, main characters, but he, he's, he's there just to be basically the foil and, and 
the man that comes between between these two women and and threatens to break this uh, bond that they have, and especially on the the older woman. You know, she was willing to go to great lengths to keep Hachi from from taking her away, the younger girl, uh, even to the point where she threatened to kill both of them while they slept. You know, she was such an interesting character. And, and you just find yourself trying to figure out what you, you know, she didn't want to give up her way of life and, and, and her dependency on, on the younger girl. And it was just interesting to see and try and figure out these little motivations that she had and, and how she was thinking about things and what she was going to do next. And it was just such an interesting character uh, story as well. And uh, he did, he just did a great job with that. It's shot beautifully. That tall grass was as much a character as any anyone who was acting in the film. You know, the writing. I, I I've read too that a lot of uh, uh, Shindo's movies had strong female leads in them, and, and I can't see any of them being any better than this one. This was just a, a very strong dynamic and very strong characterization of these two, these two women that I, I really, really got into. And that that's the mark of a good movie that, you know, you got movies these days that they could care less about character. They want to show you flash and they want to show you blood gore and this and that. This is very much a, a, a thoughtful horror inducing. I mean, the, the whole point of, them living that way and having to do the things that they did to, to stay alive was horrible, you know? And I, and at first watching it, I was going, well, that must be where the horror is coming from, that these women are having to live under these conditions. But, but uh, it just ramped up as soon as Hachi was introduced, um, that tension ramped up and the horror ramped up and, and, uh, you could feel the tension. I mean, you could, you, you knew she was going to try to sneak out at night, the younger girl to go see Hachi. And you were just on the edge of your seat going, is she going to get, she's going to get caught. She's going to get caught. And what's going to happen if she gets caught and, you know, and then that kind of thing. So that's the mark of a really, really good movie uh, to keep your interest for was an hour and 45 minutes of, of, of uh, just these very few characters interacting with each other. So I thought he did an amazing, amazing job. It's shot beautifully. It's uh, acted very well it, and, and written uh, the same thing. And the music too, Jeff, the drums with, with the, the, ja- the jazz <laughs> infused in it is the only thing that re- really marks this as a 1960s film because a lot mm-hmm. of the, you know, the jazz music. But o- other than that, like we were saying before, and Nick brought out, this is just like it was shot you know this this is just as relevant now as it, as it was 50 some years ago but yeah i think it's it's just a beautiful film to look at and a beautiful film to uh, uh enjoy on a character level as well and it's got uh demon masks <laughs> yes yeah under his uh bio on imdb he has a quote that says i have always had the souls of the 94 with me and have made them the theme of my existence does anybody know what he's talking about? The ninety four. Yeah, I, I tried to, I tried to search it a little bit, but I wasn't getting anywhere. I didn't get that deep, but it has to be. Um, the, the, I mean, it, he's from Hiroshima, so there has to be right. Some, yeah, and it, it, it's a bit of a strange one, you know. You know how political do you get with something like this? But you know, dropping a nuclear bomb on two cities in Japan has a massive effect. Oh. And you know, and World War Two had a massive effect on everybody. You know, I'm 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 from Europe, so I'm from England, so I know the effect that the you know that the Nazis had on us. But it's it's a very strange, it's it's just a strange thing to try and quantify um, having a nuclear bomb dropped on a city. I don't think um, I don't think since nine eleven we get. I don't want to get political, but this is this is the art that comes out of those conflicts. So you have to talk right. about it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not taking one side or the other. I'm just saying when something that drastic and that devastating happens to a society, there has to be some kind of output. Now, if that output 
is artistic and productive and positive like this, like Godzilla and Oni Baba, then these are cautionary tales that we need to heed. These are beautiful stories. It's not we're not talking politics. We're talking cautionary tales. So mm -hmm. right. you know, I, I think there is I think it's important at this point to define what comes out of a political situation and how society deals with it. Right. We talked a lot about that in uh, when we did Godzilla, mm -hmm. on the effect that that had on Ishiro Hondo, because I believe he was from Hiroshima as well. Well, well, well that's the, fu the funny thing is, is that's the funny thing, though, Jeff, because I remember when we discussed at the beginning, I, I, I thought, oh, yeah, Onibaba, maybe that will tie into the ring and dark water and, and you know, and the grudge. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and it really doesn't. I mean, that was a wild goose chase for me. This film just goes somewhere completely. It's it's somewhere yeah. else. It's, it's on right. a completely different level. And I'm not knocking those films. I mean, I, you know, I like those films. I think they're, you know, I think they're fantastic. I think they're great to that. But this is just like, this, this is, you know, if, if they are, um, you know, th those are kind of like hammer horror, but this is kind of more Shakespeare. You get yeah. me? There's something more. Yeah. There's something. This transcends yeah. To, yeah. to another level. There's there's parts of it that feel poetic, and yeah. and feel very artistic, and and uh, and then there's other parts that are just down and dirty and gritty, and uh, so and, and it, it's interesting to me how to see these different directors how they've incorporated the Hiroshima and the atom bomb. And like Nick said, the, like the Godzilla films and this, and this film, and I'm sure there's plenty others. It's, it's always amazing to me how through the pain and, and, and suffering of something like that, uh, how real art can, can come forth just from someone expressing themselves about it. And this is a, this is like a perfect example of that. And societies are going to deal with these traumas in different ways. And it's a bit of a strange... I mean, when, when you have 9-11, 9-11 occurred, and the way that Hollywood dealt with that seemed to be with... With all due respect, it, it, there was a lot of kind of um, weird, you know, like blue light in the sky, um, Batman v Superman, kind of destruction of buildings. Yeah, yeah. Upon, and I, I personally, as somebody from England who wasn't... I mean, I thought 9-11 was terrible, clearly, you know. Th this, this affected me, but I didn't want to see that on the cinema screen. I, I, mm -hmm. I kept feeling like these, th that this repetition of this, I didn't feel it was healthy. Um, you know, but I, I, feel, it, yeah. I feel like a lot of people here felt the same way, and that's mm -hmm. why there was such a backlash against films like Superman ben versus Batman uh, and even Man of Steel, where all this destruction of... Uh, and, I think it was too, you know, even now it's, it, it just seemed like destruction for the sake of that, which nothing, nothing artistic really uh, came out of that. Um, it wasn't an expression. It was more of a flat, like I was saying before, flashy and, and you know, that kind of thing. I, I think if that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It was empty and hollow and it yeah. was just angry. And the thing is, is like, look, if you, if you want to make, if you want to build a better world and build a better society out of this, if you look at films like Onibaba and Godzilla, they're talking about the horrors mm -hmm. of the war, mm -hmm. whereas kind of Batman v Superman, um, you know, with weird tangent, but seemed to glorify. Yeah. It, there was no cautionary tale there. Yeah, there was, there, was, there was no education to it. It was just, mm -hmm. yeah, it was very simple, very cat-handed response to it. And, you know, it's, it's nice to see... I mean, this film is set in the, the, the 14th century. It's the late 1300s. It's the beginning of a 50-year war. You know, let's remember, like, th th like, this is set in a feudal Japan at the beginning of a 50-year war. And they're trying to make something positive out of this. I mean, this is a film where your main characters are killing men for no reason, but you still sympathise with them. This is the first film ever where I have seen the main characters kill a dog and I did not get upset about it. Mm. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not because the, the reason they kill the dog in the film, they need to eat. If yeah. they don't eat, they will die. And 
it's not it's very brutal the way that they chase and kill this dog but you don't feel hate towards the characters you feel sympathy and empathy i can't remember a film that i have ever connected with where um, lead characters have killed an animal and i am okay with that it, and it, it in this film you just it, i'm very matter of fact with it i'm it, it's just very matter of fact it's not um these are not evil characters and th- th- these people are victims of their environment and they're trying to survive they're surviving yeah 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 I, I think in this day and age i think we need to remember what what it is to be the little guy and 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 i found it very profound i found that very profound right yeah well their their lives had been ruined by this war and they were surviving the only way they could you know and yeah. so you know, we are watching them. They don't have a stockpile of food. No. <laughs> they don't have refrigerators or coolers or anything or a ready, you know, or a herd of cattle or anything handy that they can uh, use for food or even to farm. It, it said somewhere I was reading that they uh, said they, they weren't able to farm because of the war that was so disruptive, you know, that they yeah. just couldn't stick, stick with something that long enough. So they had to go hide in these in this uh, grasslands the crops were initially requisitioned by the farmers and then all the farmers were requisitioned by the army so then there were no farmers and it had a devastating effect on everybody who was left behind i i remember that hachi character he commented to the young woman about the way she uh, how they had food i don't remember word for word but um she was by the water and she was, I don't know if it was fish. It had to be fish or something. And she's like smacking it. And he, and he basically commented about how he didn't see how she did what she did or what did she use uh, in order to eat in order to do what she had to do. And, and there have been so many times that he would say to the uh, mother-in-law about, well, she needs a man and this isn't, you know, ideal basically for her Mm -hmm. so and of course that scares her because she admitted to him that she she needed the young woman to be with her that codependency was important for her she she flat out said it to him she made it known yeah because up to this point they're the only thing they they've had is each other and they've come to have this they're in this survival mode where not only are they they family, but they've become sort of they're, like a working unit where they're, yeah, they're women in in a men's world, and they yeah they were in so survivor they, mode. <laughs> yeah, and they they've they come to rely on each other so much yeah. uh, to get done what they need to do to survive. Along comes Hachi, who says, "Now nah, I want to break this up." The older woman is willing to sacrifice herself, uh, even so that sexually so that things can remain the same there and right and uh but it, so you there's all these layers like nick was saying earlier there's all these interesting layers to this re- the relationship to the these two women if you've ever been hungry <laughs> if you've ever you know if you've ever gone without food or if you've ever or know someone who has they're willing to do some pretty sketchy things to to stay alive and 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 right. to eat, you know, so so you can only imagine that these two women who have nothing but basically the roof over their head, you know, um, uh, if you can put yourself in their shoes and, and for just a little bit, you can understand that relationship a little better. And it was just very interesting. And that's what's so fantastic about this film. This is a film that talks about a male dominated society. The, mm-hmm. the, the two emperors go to war. They are men. They conscribe their armies of men. They conscribe the armies of farmers to feed the soldiers who are men, and they leave everybody else behind. And the women are left with nothing. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy. And you have these two women, and the thing I love about this film the most, these two women, right, we look in our modern society for female heroes. Like I'm not even going to go go into Star Wars with with because, but we we look at like Ripley and Sarah Connor. I I love Ripley. I love Ellen Ripley. 
when I saw this film, I'm like, damn, <laughs> this is this is something else. These are two women who are victims of their environment. They are victims of circumstance, but they are not victims. These two women get it done. Mm. They adapt to their environment. Now, the opening of this film, it's like boom, 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 boom. You've got this um, crazy opening where um, there are samurai fighting. There's a man going through the grass, the crazy drum beat going on. And it builds up to this point where you think that there's a rival battle is going to ensue between these men. These men are going to fight. These men are going to have a war. This is going to be great. But it's not. You've got these two guys drifting into the grass they're exhausted, and then out of the grass, they are speared mm. by these two women. And the thing is, is like these women aren't conniving or snide. These women are, they are resourceful. They are victims of their environment, and they are victims of circumstance, but they are not victims. They are powerful women. They are very strong characters. These are the probably the most... You know, you look at um, characters with agency. These two, these two characters. I mean, when I first watched this film, I was just writing about the older woman all day. But then when I watched it again, I was what I was writing all day about the younger woman, because they have just these two characters just have so much agency in this. They control their environment. They are Mm -hmm. in charge of their environment, and the, the. you know, the, the fact that Hatchie comes along, it's not the fact that he's, yeah, he's a man and he does disrupt the environment, but it's it's not just the fact that he is a man. You know, the, there's more to it than that. The, the, the countryside has been devoid of men and these two women have had agency on their own. But these two characters are fierce. They're wild. They are, yeah. they, they are something else. But these two characters, I have not seen... Um, I've not seen female characters depicted like this before, and not in 1964. I'll, like I said, I'll talk Ellen Ripley and Sarah Connor. I'm talking like 1979 and beyond. This is 1964. Mm-hmm. They're taking on these supposedly, you know, vicious or, or uh, fearsome samurai warriors and and soldiers. Granted, they're hiding in the grass, but still, and they're they don't shrink from that at all. There's yeah. one line where uh, Hachi is saying to the the younger woman, the daughter in law, I forget what she says, something about, well, I can't do that, or I've never done that, and, and he's like, what do you mean? You kill people for a living, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you could do this. Well, they, like, they perfected their game. You you, yeah, have to, you, you know they've been doing this for years, and they just they know what they had have, have to do, and they do it, and. They've just, they're at the top of their game, you know, unlike these soldiers who are wandering through this grass and have no idea really what's around them. And it's two small women with spears that just that take out these warriors, you know. And uh, I think you make a great point there, Chad. I think the point is, is that they are making, I think the women are making a point that we've been flung into this situation. The yeah. men have been conscripted into this situation and, this is a legal situation for the war, and therefore it's it's all above board. It's part of the cause, and you know, for the greater good, and all of that nonsense. And we've right. been left behind, and that, that I think that's the point. There is a class struggle argument here. Again, I don't want to get political, but it's it's writ large in the film. That's what it's saying. I think what mm. you know, one thing I find interesting though is like. I have um, in my notes. I, I I can I cannot call Nobuko Ottawa an old woman. She's not an old woman. She's she's fantastic. Right. 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 This is a this is um. Do you remember the film Monster with um? Oh, what was she, what she called out of Mad Max? Who, who plays uh, Charlie Theron? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sha- yeah, Charlie Theron. She played uh, um. She played Eileen um, Warner. Eileen Warner. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In Monster. And she ugly herself up. This is a similar situation. Yeah. Nabuko Ottawa is not an ugly woman. I'm interested to hear what Whitney has to say about this because, I mean, Whitney, I mean, clearly, 
this is this is a beautiful woman. She, she I think she, she's a, she's at a peak here, but she is playing. She's playing a savage, ugly, oh, yeah. wretched creep. But she is not. But I mean, what do you think about this performance? Because to me, this this took me in. I'll hand it over to you. I just think this is a phenomenal performance because she really, you know, she 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 throws in this ugly like the the, the film is like only Barbar trans to old hag devil. She's not an old hag. Okay, first of all, she, yeah, she's the she's the mother in law, right? I'm bad with names. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. Right. No. Oh my gosh. So let me, let me, uh, I guess I'll comment on her aesthetic here. And I was more drawn at first. What caught my attention was when you, it wasn't, it wasn't just her uh, personality that was like developing, but her aesthetic. And what I mean by I, I, I was actually in love with her hair. And because of her, <laughs> I I loved seeing how beautiful and thick, but I'm, I didn't research into it. I don't know if you guys did, but I don't know if that was a wig or what, but she had some gray to it in her black hair. And I, I thought, okay, this, this is almost something that I would see in like Lily Munster or Elsa Lancaster as far as Bride of Frankenstein or something, because I was seeing that gray and black and I I love, I love seeing that. I love seeing that in, in uh, those kinds of um, classic women characters. And I just thought, Ooh, that's a, that's a Lily Munster look to me. And I loved it in her hair and uh, a bride, the bride Frankenstein kind of look. But anyway, yes, loved her hair, but her performance and her as a person, as her uh, character, Okay, so I have mixed feelings as far as, yes, she was a badass. Yes, she definitely had to survive. But I had a weird, I felt a type of way, what young people say. I feel a type of way, a certain type of way about how she started to treat the young woman. And then uh, because of that fear of her leaving. And then Chad said something like, well, well, maybe she was, she was, uh, even willing to sacrifice herself when I thought, hmm, interesting way to look at it. But I thought women can be competitive and will be desperate for that kind of friendship and to have that kind of codependency in that situation. And it could be toxic. And I saw her becoming toxic. And and it was it was just a strange development. And when I saw that toxicity develop, I saw her even in her own character kind of developed more monstrous a little bit her hair got a little bit more mm. raggedy and everything and i just thought oh, yeah. wow this woman is fierce <laughs> well that that whole development of her character of her of her getting more toxic played <laughs> right into the of the story of her yeah. with the mask and, and and all that so yeah you're absolutely right it just that it just kept ramping up and ramping up uh, as the film went on. Well, did and she, uh, do you think that, uh, cause I, I felt like there was two sides of this thing is I couldn't tell for sure if she was, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Possessive yes, of the daughter-in-law's relationship possessive. with the daughter-in-law yeah. or she was jealous and wanted. It could be both, you know, that's for, very... for no other reason, wanted sex with this other guy. Why are you ignoring me? You know? Right. Yeah. If that was all tied into the same motive of of the, uh, you know, being possessive over or over her uh, relationship with uh, her daughter in law, and you know, the daughter in law and her are sort of tied together because up until this Hachi shows up, mm -hmm. they don't know what happened to the son, right? So, and he reminds them of that in yes. some forms, like, well, he he, I was there, and he and he had basically saying implied that he must have been killed. He's like, well, I was there, mm -hmm. and, and all of this. So I yeah, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the, one of the things too, that it's kind of left up in the air and probably to whoever the viewer, the audience is, as to what you think her motivations are. Right. You know, because you're, you, it never really spells it out in black and white. That's the fascinating thing about this film is because if you try to put this film in a category, you couldn't. And if you try to put the older woman's definite um, motivations in a category, you couldn't. I mean, on the one hand, she's behaving very selfishly, but the thing is, is you know, if if the younger woman 
runs off with the guy, then she, you know, with, with Hatchie, she can't, she can't survive yeah. anymore. She will die. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and 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 I agree. You know, I I found myself throughout the film. One minute I'm thinking you're being very selfish, and then the next minute I'm thinking you you are just trying to survive. But the thing is, right. this film is is full of killers and cutthroats and mm-hmm. thieves and bandits. Yes. So the symbolism of this film, I think, did, did, did anybody notice the garments that the two women were wearing? Did anybody notice the symbols on the garments that the two women were wearing? It's no. not a trick question. I saw the symbols, but I did not. I did yeah, not I, I was having a hard time pick out. I was noticing on the younger one, she had like, I don't know if it was a, a like spokes or like a sun rays or what that was on the back it was something circular with lines going out from the center okay and i think so, the older woman had a uh, like a dragon didn't she or uh you, you okay. straighten us out if you were paying attention yeah to closer I, I i shall straighten you out i shall <laughs> I, I shall straighten you out on this one like check this out this is this is really interesting on the older woman's kimono right i paused oh, this I on, on hasty go on jeff Oh, I just, I've got it running in the background. I always do that. So it's a crab. It's a crab. Correct. Yeah. On the older woman's kimono, she's got a crab. On the younger woman's kimono, she's got a clam. Hmm. Now, crabs oh. and clams, c- crabs and clams, they're both bottom feeders. I mean, obviously, a crab works on, you know, they're, they're nice. omnivores. They feed on algae and animal matter. Oh. Clams kind of a filter feeders. They, they feed on... They can either live in fresh water or salt water, but they tend to burrow in salt water. But there's a symbolism there. There is a symbolism there. The fact that they are, um, you know, the, the bottom feeders, it's a means of survival. But it's there on their on their garments. And I don't think mm-hmm. it was an accident that – I don't think it was, it was an accident. There was, there was a clear design. There. Yeah, I don't know. So it's because, showing where they were there – level in life is they're at the very bottom of the yeah ex- exactly and yeah. and 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 that's why and that you know that's why you don't feel bad I, I think it's interesting though the way um going back to the way that the i mean i, I can't label her as the old woman because she's she's such a beautiful woman nabuko ottawa um but the way that the older woman is shot and before we get into the, I mean, we haven't, we, you know, we've been talking at length here and we haven't even got into the, um, the horror of the mask, but the way that the, the way that she is shot, the way that they, she is filmed and the way that she is lit, she is lit and shot and the makeup that she's wearing makes her look like an old hag. She's not an old hag. Right. This is a beautiful woman. This is a beautiful, strong woman. Who is playing into this yeah. old hag sensibility? But I just find it interesting the way that they use the makeup, lighting, and shadows to make mm. her look unflattering. And I think this will come back later when we start to talk about the mask. If you look at the way that they shoot light makeup, Nabuko Atawa, for her shots as the old woman. It's very much the same way that the mask is shot later on in the film. Yeah. Oh yeah. And she's a she is a beautiful woman. If you guys have yes. looked at her picture, um, you know, out of this makeup, mm-hmm. so she's very beautiful. So the way she pulled this off was was amazing. And a lot of that lighting reminded me a lot of the way James Whale lit some of the characters in Bride of Frankenstein, like uh, Thessinger's character, and and, mm-hmm. and 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 some of those deep shadows and 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 uh, close-ups and stuff like that um, to make the character look more menacing. And, and so that, it reminded me a lot of that. So, yeah, the lighting did a lot as far as the effect of how they wanted her face to look and, and the menace in her face. Exactly. And, and, and as an actor, you have to be prepared to be unflattering. Mm-hmm. And I think, oh, yeah. and I, I think she, she threw herself into this role. This is this is a this is a masterclass in how to throw yourself into a role mm-hmm. of looking underwhelming. Yeah, to, don't to be afraid to be ugly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And both of them, 
uh, including uh, Jetsuku Yoshimura, they had to, you know, there's large parts of the film where they're not showing much emotion, but then there is, they do have to show full ranges. Uh, for instance, and, and we need to talk about the whole as well, but when the middle-aged one or, or uh, um, Nabucco, Ottawa, um, when she goes into the hole to get the mask, right after after yeah after she tricks the guy down there when when he grabs her leg she's really i mean there's definite is she's so good at at her craft the, the way she exhibits that shock and fright and then the same thing with with jitsuko yoshimura when she's being chased and and when uh she gets you know she becomes very infuriated and goes to get the mask off of uh, her mother-in-law and mm. uh, the way that she does that. And then how she reacts, what she looks like that. I just thought both of them were excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, this is an acting masterclass and it, it's, it's a film that is not whole. No, it's not the exorcist or the omen or no, this is right, a right, film right. that is highly regarded. This is, a, but this is a film that is not only on that level. It's, it's above that level. You know, this is something that, um, you know, transcends that, but you know, you know, it's because it's ahead of its time, and I think the problem is, is it's ahead of its time because a, you've got female empowerment, b, right. you've you've got female empowerment, and c, you've got female. <laughs> this this film, this film must have really upset the establishment. I can oh, understand okay. why the BBFC cut this right. The BBFC today is called the British Board of Film Classification. Back in the day, uh, it, was the Brit- it, it was the British Board of Film censorship, and they were yeah, very censored, yeah. and they did not like this sort of thing, you know, women liking sex. Oh, what was this, women empowered? And, you know, you know, he didn't like that kind of thing back then. Mm-hmm. Right. This film it not, is not only about female empowerment, it's about female sexuality, it's, and it's, it's about a lot. Of, this is 1964. This film just... it's. And this is why, to me, I, I this is the other reason why I would say that this is a film that feels like it was shot yesterday. It's views on sexuality and, and equality on, and, you know, one thing that really irritates me these days is, like, you've got Kathleen Kennedy with Star Wars trying to create, and, and Ghostbusters, the new Ghostbusters, trying to yeah, give female... Yeah. It, it's really condescending to... to I, I just find it condescending... If you look at a film like this, this is a film that shows female empowerment, and and this is this this is you shouldn't have to fabricate and water down and you know and, and gentrify female empowerment. That it female empowerment exists in its purest form if you have the right director and the right actors and the right script writers and the right story. This is the perfect, and, and this is 1964. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to right. fabricate. Right. Don't fabricate equality. This is a perfect example of equality, and and this and this is why this film blew my mind. You know, this film blew my mind for that. You can't scrabble over. You know, trying to pander to an audience. Don't pander to an audience. This is you know, just write good stories, write good characters, yeah. and these are characters who are unambiguous. These are unambiguous characters. These are strong characters. They are in. It doesn't matter what gender they are. It just matters that they that they are who they are because they're good characters. Right. That's it. Period. Why is it so hard? Well, we, as we look, we look at this movie now, or if somebody who's never seen it sees it now, they're used to seeing this type of uh, portrayal of women in certain films. Uh, but you have to. It's like we always say, looking at um, movies in the time they were made, 56 years old, 1964. This is this is an unheard of thing, at least in America. It is. This is an unheard of thing in this empowerment of these of these women. Mm-hmm. And I, I would have been so interested to see the reactions of people back then and to this film who if it was seen in America at, at the time, um, what those reactions might be. 
So uh, to kind of put this on the scale of what young women and girls feel today is a sense of fear and sometimes a sense of shame of leaving their families and especially in today's society, depending on what culture you're in, and it's very much common in half of my culture, in some families, and I can't speak for most Mexican families, but in some Mexican families, um, it is so important for you know, the the young woman, the girl, to to kind of stay along with the family and that 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 relationship is second nature. Your family's first, that man is second, and and then I feel like this mother-in-law kind of had that drawback mentality of that some sort of possession of no, I come first. And then she kind, but she twisted that around a little bit more and made her feel fearful of her own individuality, of her own sexuality, and made her feel a little bit shameful. And she used that because she found that mask. She even said things to this girl about. Uh, well, those kinds of things that you're thinking of doing or you're doing with this person that's she used religion and all of this these sorts of like scare tactics she even like scared the girl to death the girl woke up from a nightmare from she said she saw this thing she yeah. saw the demon so i mean she used these scare tactics as to things that what actually some people do to their own families to keep girls staying in the family unit, like attacking them for their individuality, attacking them uh, in fear of what they might be growing into their own person or uh, their own being, or even, you know, with a partner. So it's, but that's, that's somewhat of a, a emotional battle and a horrific yeah. kind of, yeah. can be traumatic, uh, almost abus- abusive yeah. in some situations, but that's, that's my take when I watched this. <laughs> No, it, it was very religious. I mean, um, you know, you could put it in a Christianity Catholicism as well from the right. UK perspective. We can see that, you know, you know, no marriage outside of wedlock. You know, you can't right. be doing this kind of thing. And it's interesting that, you know, that this film was um, subjected to a hit from the UK census because of that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah. it's the same, you know, it, it's the same kind of cultural, um, you know, ca- kind of cultural restrictions, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about the mask. And yeah, just to uh to outline it just a little bit. This was uh based on a uh Shin Buddhist parable mm-hmm. called the bride scaring or scarring, bride scaring mask. Mask with flesh attached. <laughs> in which a mother used a mask to scare her daughter from going to the temple. She was punished by the mask sticking to her face, and when she begged to be allowed to remove it, she was able to take it off, but it took the flesh of her face with it. Mm-hmm. So this is, I mean, obviously this is a, the, the exact same thing, but that's this uh, samurai warrior or masked warrior that shows up, uh, has this mask on. Um, so uh, you guys... You know, what did you think? What did you think? Did that mask represent anything, or was it just what it was? Uh, well, I think he he made reference that he used it in battle to um, intimidate his 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 opponents and his. But yeah, I, you, I also got the feeling too that there was a, a different side to the story there. Everything's there for a reason, and and. If if she put it on to intimidate or scare the younger girl, it makes me wonder if there's a different reason that he put it on, you know, because there seems to be some kind of curse or something surrounding the mask. So I know if that thing walked into my little hut and uh, and I turned around and it was standing there, I would just go ahead and end it right there, <laughs> right there yeah. you know, because it is yeah. a scary looking mask. And, well, he and, uh, and he makes up this other story that's that's uh, he adds to it that he's, he's so handsome, right? Right. Oh yeah. But knowing so <laughs> well that he probably like, yeah, I'm like, oh really? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe he was at one point. So anyway, Nick, the mask. From my research, the mask is it's it's a traditional North Theatre. It's a Hanya mask from North Theatre, from what I can remember. I mean, if if you look at this film, it's. 
there are certain aspects of this film that look like a black and white cinema, but there are certain aspects. The way that the, the demon appears in the field is like strange lighting from nowhere. And the way that the samurai appears in the hut, it looks kind of odd. It, there is there is a kind of surreal imagery to this film, which is kind of cinema and theatre. And the thing is, is like this, you know, as Jeff as and as Jeff and Chad have both alluded to, this is um, a Buddhist parallel. And but this Buddhist parallel was enacted through the No Theatre, and the the Hanya mask is a traditional Japanese mask that is a female demon or or a woman driven driven mad through jealousy right. and obsession you know it symbolizes the female rage and pain now the thing is when you take the mask and it you look straight on at the mask and it looks menacing you know the shots of the samurai coming into the hut this samurai looks very menacing but at the end of the film when she's screaming and holding on to the mask, she looks sorrowful and sad. The first time we see the mask when it leaps out of the grass, it's so scary. But the end and the side view, again, it looks painful and agonizing. Now, mm. the thing is, is here's the funny thing is, I was at, um, from first-hand experience, I was in um, some weird kind of voodoo shop in Newquay in Cornwall. And they said, you take a picture of this weird doll from a different angle and it will change. The expression will change no matter how many times you take it. And they were right. If you took a picture of this doll, mm -hmm. every time you took a picture of the doll, even if you thought it was the same angle, the expression would change slightly. But that's there's a trick in the light and the technique. And the thing is about the um, – and this is why um, – the Hanya mask is so amazing because if you bend down and look up, it looks agonizing in pain. It, it, you know, you know, the, it's blatantly obvious what they did with that mask. That mask is fantastic. At the end of the film, it's phenomenal. It's so, you know, it, it, it's iconic. It, that's 50 years and 60 years of cinema in textbooks. That is something you will see. But the imagery, the technique they use to make that mask look that way was just by slightly filming it from a different angle and using different style of lighting. They filmed it from this way, shone a little bit of light on it. That way, if you look up, the mask looks menacing. If you look down, and I, I'm not being, it, 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 it looks tragic. I'm not being reductive. This is theatre. We have to understand yeah. that, that this is theatre and you have to look at the simplicity of theatre is lighting, angles and expression you have like three basic things there and and this is you know this is why i want to look at the no theater and the hanya mask the, the, the hanya mask is iconic you look at that mask that mask was in the exorcist let's not forget that there is a scene in the exorcist that that film you know william Friedkin straight up ripped off that hanya mask from onibaba and put it in the exorcist he, he, he was a big fan um, wow. And yeah, and, and the Scorsese is a big fan, and Guillermo del Toro is a big fan, and I will, yes. I will elaborate on that later. But the, the the mask is something that is so deliberate and so amazing. I, I don't want to undermine the 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 effectiveness of the mask. I just want to say is, I think they use that same technique to make Nabucco Ottawa look ugly. They filmed her at weird angles oh, sure. with mm -hmm. eggs and weird lighted. And it, what, what I'm trying to say is um, the mask and Nabucco Ottawa as the older woman and the mask, they use this same technique. It's a very, very clever technique that they use to make them both look sympathetic and ugly or sexy or not. But it's there's a brilliant stylistic technique utilised by the director and by the cinematographer and by the lighting guy and it's it's genius it's, re it's real genius what these people did with it, uh, on that on a technical level you're absolutely right because it looks depending on the the shot it looks fearsome and scary or itself in anguish uh, yeah. when, they, when they're trying to take it off so that, yeah that trying is to beat it off with the camera. yeah it's, yeah yeah it's very painful and then the mask suddenly turns into this mask of uh, pain yeah 
And it's definitely symbolic of everything of sort of what's being hidden and what's what's about to be revealed uh, within that chemistry and relationship of the mother-in-law and the girl. It, that's kind of how I saw it with that mask eventually. And then coming towards the end, when the girl, she does, when they're fighting, that, that was that, the way it just ended right there with, with that whole fight. But prior to that, just she she had said that that was her punishment for trying to get involved in metal in her life the way she mm-hmm. did, the way it right. stuck, and then seeing that it did pull away and it did pull when it was she was forcing it off of her and then seeing uh, it was just a struggle. And that was actually painful for me. I cringed <laughs> to to see. And it, it was very effective, just even some of the sound bits and things to see that that struggle of pulling and chipping away at some stuff at the, at the mask and then at her hair, the mother-in-law's hair and her face. And then eventually seeing how, how torn her, her flesh just kind of looked. It was, it it was excruciating (laughs) and it was pretty brutal. One thing I guess I'll throw in, I, I don't, I didn't really get to look too much into Nick. If you know anything about, did the makeup artist, I'm pretty sure the makeup artist had something to do with the way the mask looked, right? Because I have noticed, I I can't even pronounce the name of the person, but it's like Shigeo Kobayashi. And this person has worked with this director a few times before, from what I have noticed. Funnily enough, I did not even look into the makeup. I, 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 didn't, I did not dig into the makeup. And that is That's something okay. that... Yeah, Shigeo Kobayashi is... Uh... Uh, it says makeup department head. Yeah. So I don't know if that means, <laughs> or, or, or the head of the makeup department, right? And uh, yeah. Kaniyasu Masuda, another makeup artist, but it doesn't list a, a special effects person. Yeah. Well, there's no, special um, effects. Yeah, there is. Yoshio oh. Kirahara. I mean, on, 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 the, on the makeup effects and on the special effects, and what happened with the mask? I mean, what do we believe? happen with the mask. I mean, because for me, I, I, I'm looking at this film on like on a hundred different levels. I mean, this could just be basically a period piece or it could be a folk tale or it could be a horror or it could be a supernatural horror, but it could be none of them. I mean, how, how do we feel about the, the mask element? Like, was the mask stuck to the samurai's face or... Was that a curse or or was it not a curse? Because the older woman was able to wear this mask twice, but it was only when she wore the mask in the rain that she could not remove the mask. And then when the mask was removed, did she actually tear her face off like in the Buddhist parable or did she just have a skin condition that was transmitted from the samurai to her? I mean... I mean, I like ambiguity in a film, and I am not asking for an answer. I don't want an answer. I just, I'm just interested to know what does everybody else think about this because there are ten different ways of looking at how that mask yeah. stuck to her face, and what what does Whitney think? What does Chad think? And what does Jeff think? I definitely go with the supernatural side of it, based on the idea of the original story, the original mm-hmm. parable. Mm-hmm. Same with me. Just and also because I like to have unexplained things. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's just interesting to me that the the supernatural would find its way to these two 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 people and affect them in some way, and, and that just that's how I was looking. And, and you, you guys know me; I'm always looking for that supernatural angle. So it it, it was very interesting that this curse cursed mask as as I like to think of it would come along and and punish somebody for something. Just like I think it was punishing that the samurai for some reason. But that's just me. Yeah, so the mask is an incredible image. I mean it's everybody knows it when they see it. They may not you know it we see it lots of places, but we may not know where it came from and and mm-hmm. this is the spot that I know of now the mask could be available as Nick said as a kind of a standard type of mask in uh, uh, Japanese theater. 
I want to talk about the hole. We start yeah. off with the hole. So what what's the, what's up with the hole? There's like this. Uh, I don't know. I suppose it's uh, six foot, maybe eight foot diameter hole that goes down. I don't know far enough that when you fall down it, you die <laughs> or are mm-hmm. mortally injured. Did that was there was that supposed to symbolize something or was that just a uh, sort of a, a plot device or? Well, they had to put the body somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I certainly think it symbolizes something, but I don't. I'm not sure I want to go there. But correct me if I'm wrong. But for some reason, I thought I have uh, somewhere towards the beginning of the film, like they have kind of lured someone towards it. I, I did. I yes. thought I did. Yes. 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 So, so it's definitely. I okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So there's like this. I see it as just a trap. That's again. It plays into their survival and the, how they just, uh, like you said, have someone just die or have be mortally <laughs> just wounded. It just, just, it would just be horrible. The outcome would just be horrible. And it, and it was. <laughs> well, on the first two warriors they kill who are yeah. running from the other soldiers. After they kill them and and. Uh, take all of their stuff, then they drag right. them and throw them down the hole. But yeah. later on, there's another time. I think it's the uh, uh, the mask warrior that they he lure him. Yeah, yeah, it's a trap. Yeah. Well, he kind of set up the, for the very end of the film when the older yes. woman jumps, mm-hmm. and you don't know if she made it or not. You know? Yeah, that's right. So they, they, that kind of, for me, that kind of just set up that ambiguous ending, you know, did she make it? Did she not make it? Uh, just a, I thought that was just a masterful <laughs> ending to the movie too. But I think the whole kind of set that up, mm-hmm. set all that up for the end. I love the way they shot when the people, when the people that they threw or fell into the hole, they shot it from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was uh, for me anyway, that was, carried more weight to it, more emotional weight and feeling of them glancing off the sides as they came down. Mm-hmm. The, fa- the fantastic thing about this film is um, I-, I studied um, I studied English literature um, as, a, as a student, and I, I studied a book called Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. Thomas uh-huh. Hardy wrote uh, Tess of the Div, Bivills, and some other books. But basically, yeah. the, 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 um, on Return of the Native, Here's the thing, right? And and this is why I found this film crazy interesting because there are dozens of scholars worldwide over the last hundred years who have dissected the return of the native because of the way that this book represents Egdon Heath. The, the, the book is set in Egdon Heath in Hardy's Wessex and there is a chapter in the book Return of the Native that actually creates the landscape. Uh, the landscape is a character and the landscape is a personification of nature. And it's a kind mm. of symbol for the cosmic world of mankind. Now, this has been something that has been debated. I am not the person to tell you about this, but scholars worldwide have written essays about this over and over God. again. Now, one thing I will tell you that I took from that book and that course is that the landscape can sometimes reflect the human condition and that it kind of mirrors and predicts moods and events. Ah. And that some characters are kind of subordinate to their place in nature, but the environment can also be harsh and unforgiving to characters who view it as a prison. And the thing that I remember from studying Return of the Native was that the landscape was the main character of the story. And when I watched Onibaba, I just went straight away, immediately. Yeah. This film is... The, the, the main character of this film is not the older woman, it's not the younger woman, it's not Hachi. The main character is the environment. It, it is a constant visual feat. Sometimes it symbolizes or represents human emotion or in in a certain way. The violent grass moves gently and slowly. Sometimes it's sensual. When, when When the young woman is running through the grass, it's the same as the way the samurais are running through the grass at the beginning, except there's a different sexual charge. Right. 
I saw that. Yeah, the, the, it, there is a violence and a, an emotion, or there is a gentle and a flowing emotion. Sometimes it's vigorous and tempestuous. Sometimes it's lustuous and there's a desire and sometimes there is a calm. The main character of Oni Baba is not the older woman, is not the younger woman. It's not heart, she's not deep. It's, it's the environment. These people are subsequent to their environment and um, it's a cruel and different environment. But the thing is, is like this film is set you know, um, in the 14th century, in the late 1300s, these people are gone, but that Suzuki grass is still there. If you go to Japan these days, that Suzuki grass is still there. And I think that's what I'm trying to say. If there is a kind of higher essence here, there's, there, is, there is a greater meaning. And the whole, the thing about the whole, the first thing I thought when I was looking at the whole was evil dead. It's It's... I'm pretty sure Sam Raimi has seen this film because yeah. what ancient what ancient presence what what ancient presence lurks in that hole? I mean that I mean there is there is a very evil dead. There is a very ancient presence. I mean, who dug that hole? Did 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 these two dig that hole? Is this an ancient hole? Is this a well? How long has that hole been there? Yeah, those, well, those that holes hole, get cleaned up pretty good, uh, pretty quickly. But those, oh, but yeah, yeah. That hole lurked there from the beginning. And the thing is, if you watch the first immediate shot of this film, it's, it's, have you seen A Razorhead by David Lynch? Yes. It, it's almost the same thing. And it's also very, um, I mean, I've, I've got a list of notes that I wrote on my initial viewing of this film in the first 20 minutes. And I've written Night of the Living Dead. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Seven Samurai, Star Wars, A Razorhead, Wicker Man, Evil Dead. And that was the first 20 minutes that I was watching this film. Those are the first things that I wrote. I think there are things so evocative in this film. And that, that whole, I mean, if you go back and watch that opening scene, it's very Sam Raimi and very um, David Lynch. There's just something very strange a very ancient evil about this hole because we are never told about where this hole comes from. This hole is just there. And we just accept this hole as being what it is. But th th this hole is an ancient evil that kind of pervades the whole landscape. This is an ancient, e ancient evil that has been there from, you know, or it could be, or, they, or have they dug the hole, but we don't know. Mm. No, no. So yeah, I, I would agree in that the, the environment is is interesting in that all we have is water, the Suzuki grass, and the hole, pretty much, right? And these bare minimum dwellings that the Hachi lives in and the and the two women live in. And that's it. That Suzuki grass. The way that the, the grass is moved is and filmed, it's not accidental. The way that it sways and moves. It, when there's a poignant point in the film, like like when 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 the younger woman is running to Hachi, that it's that that grass moves violently. In the day when it's sunshine and they are fishing, it's smooth, it's swaying smoothly. In the days when they are killing samurai, it's it's flashing violently. There are the way uh, that that grass is filmed, it's it's very specific. Uh, so I, I did want to mention a comment that. I think Whitney said that the uh, head of the makeup department was, was with um, Shindo on, on a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. um, the same is true of the person that wrote the music, Hikaru Hayashi, uh, which I just thought was brilliant. So, and I would also quickly advise people to to watch Canerco, which is a 1968 film by. Uh, mm -hmm. Kaneto Shindo, they and it has a similar foundation but entirely different story of two women who are raped and killed by Ooh. samurais, Gosh. and they make a deal with uh, like the demons or the devil or whoever that if they if they let them live they can uh, kill all the samurais. That's, that's very interesting. If you can find that, it's K O N E R, and it's actually it's also known as Black Cat. So, so yeah, we need to wind up. So let me let me go to uh, 
Nick, and if he can uh, fire away, because I because I do want to hear these. Okay, so um, the legacy of this film, first off, is Guillermo del Toro is a big fan. Oh yeah, yeah. And Guillermo del Toro, to me, I think he's the greatest director at the moment. I mean, Denis Villeneuve. I, I love Denis Villeneuve, but right now, you know. Guillermo del Toro for the last 20, 30 years has been a phenomenal um, inspiration to the horror genre. Now, this isn't something directly linked to Onibaba, but if Onibaba and Coroneco are two of Guillermo del Toro's favorite films. Now, The Pale Man in Pan's Labyrinth, because of Onibaba and Coroneco, um, Guillermo del Toro, um, learned about the legend, the Japanese legend of Tenome, which was a blind man who was murdered by a mugger. And he became so anguished and angry and furious as a ghost that he lost his, he lost his eyes, that he grew new eyes in the palm of his hands. That oh, formed wow. the inspiration for the pale man in Pan's Labyrinth. So even though Pan's Labyrinth is directly influenced by Onibaba or Kuroneko, the Pale Man is directly influenced by Japanese folk legend. Sure. Right. Sure. Secondly, Casino. There is a big character death scene in Casino. I will not say this right now, even though it's 25 years old. I don't want to upset anybody. But there is a murder in a cornfield where somebody is beaten to death and buried in a pit. Martin yeah. Scorsese is a big fan of classic horror films. Martin Scorsese loves Onibaba. That mm-hmm. culminating death scene in the last act of Casino is a direct influence. The death in the cornfield is a direct influence. Scorsese is on record of saying that he took that from Onibaba. Another one, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> now, <laughs> Right, oh, wow. this is, right, check this out, check this out. This like, yeah, yeah, it. right. Do you remember when Lancelot storms the castle and there's yeah. the two guys, yeah, the wedding yeah. scene, right? And Lancelot <laughs> storms, right, right, go on YouTube and watch that. Now, and I, I wrote this down about two or three weeks ago and I didn't fact check it. And then tonight, before I came online, I thought, I better fact check this. And I went on YouTube and I, and I put in Monty Python, um, Lancelot, and it's right, the, the, the scene when he runs up to the castle and then all of a sudden it stopped. And then he stops, oh, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Onibaba. And I guarantee yeah. it, right, as a musician, it's the same drums and it's the same, it's the same drums and then the same pause. The same oh, wow. drums and the same <laughs> pause. It is yeah. Terry Gilliam has completely homaged Monty Python and all that's the great. Awesome. No, that, yeah, that's that. pretty cool. That's a yeah. great catch. Yeah, yeah, and it's a fact. And here's one that will blow your mind as well. Planet of the Apes. Is anybody going to jump on this? Planet of the Apes? The original? Yeah, 1968 Planet of the Apes. Think about the opening scene. There's a scene in the high grass yeah. when they're hunting oh, all yeah, the humans yeah, 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 at the yeah, start yeah, of the yeah. film, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Revisit that. Right, watch it again. That was filmed in 1968. Now go on YouTube, watch that scene, or if you have access to that film, you have it on Blu-ray or whatever, watch that scene, and it's pretty much identical to Onibaba, not just the visuals in the long grass of the human hunt, but the 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 music is a very similar musical setting. And that's oh, 1968 yeah. compared to 1964. I would guarantee. Uh, I would guarantee that you, there is somebody somewhere has seen Onibaba, and you know there, there is direct influence there. But yeah, I mean, I, I think this film is. Um, it's. I mean, there are other influences that I could cite. Um, Romeo Point, um, a South Korean Vien- Vietnamese ghost story from two thousand and four, makes visual references and so on and so on. Halloween three. Have you noticed how the um, how the skeletons in the pit look like the mask from Halloween 3. You know, the skull mask. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was looking at that, those skeleton heads, and, and they definitely had a, a style to them. Yeah. Yeah, they're so big and so iconic. They, they just have this 
the, this visual references. Yeah, this is a definite visual reference. I'm, I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's nailed on, but Planet of the Apes is a definite. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is a definite. Casino is a definite. But Halloween Three, I wouldn't be surprised if they took those masks. From because you know there is there are there's, there's some similarities there. You know. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, th- there's a uh, scene that we I'm I don't want to start a conversation, but I just want to bring it up that I found to be very powerful, and it's when the two women are sitting outside of their hut, and I think I think maybe Whitney mentioned this, but they're pounding uh, like uh, I'm assuming they're pounding grain you know pulverizing grain mixed in with dough and and the younger woman has that large almost like a post that she's slamming down yeah. on the rock yeah and and the 40 you know the the her mother-in-law is is kneading it and turning it over so she's hitting it at a different time there's there's a whole lot going on there i mean the 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 daughter-in-law looks really fierce as she doing it. And I kept waiting for her to, you know, the timing to get off and, or to smack the mother-in-law or whatever. And the mother-in-law is manipulating her and talking about these different styles of hell and all this other mm-hmm. stuff going on. I, I just thought that was an incredible scene. The mm-hmm. power that was in the way that she was driving that post down, um, the, the sort of the, the uh, potential violence you know, that was in that scene, but also the way that she was, uh, the mother-in-law was manipulating her. I, I, anyway, that one tricked my trigger. No, th- those scenes at the hammers are, are um, symbolic throughout the whole of the film. And if, if you cut them down and put them into a, a perspective, it's basically, it's just symbolic of the, of the lower working class. The hammer and sickle, you know, they just the, the toil, the toil, the toil is what you're talking about. Mm. And then there's the scene at the uh, the waterside where I think she's washing clothes. Um, she's beating it with a stick is, is what I took it to be. And then uh, beats the mask with a hammer, right? Well, um, exa- and the, yeah, exactly, yeah. And and the uh, the the uh, mother in law is also beating. Some, she has some long thing. I kind of assume she's she's making like leather thong or something. She's beating something long and thin and ter- you know. Anyway, all that stuff. Was, there was a lot of neat stuff going on there. Uh, Chad and Whitney. Uh, let's go with Chad first. You have any final thoughts about Anibaba? Just that it was a very um, pleasant surprise. Uh, having known about this movie for so long and never really having uh, wanting to really watch it because, of, you know, but even though it had the scary mask, uh, the plot of it didn't grab me. So it was, it was a very, very pleasant surprise to watch this movie mm-hmm. and, and to have enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and I think, and I, I feel like we've only, <laughs> we've only touched on, uh, yeah, that's absolutely a, a true. small part of, of of everything that can be uh, said about this this film. And I, I would tell anybody that's a classic era fan, um, seek this movie out. I think it is on it's HBO Max. I think to to go and watch this movie, you you have to see this movie. Highly recommend it. And Whitney. Oh gosh! Again, I guess like it kind of goes back to it, it's different for me. This this kind of film is very different. There's uh there's drama, there's um a, r- a relationship that you will see between two females and their bond and the struggle to survive and in a horror horrific environments that it's it's almost it's it's very much uh, grimy and in some ways uncomfortable, but I mean, horror is supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. And um, it, it, this, this definitely made me feel uncomfortable on certain levels to observe these relationships go in a horrific direction. But I mean, I think this, this one was brilliant. It was smart. It, it definitely took a different direction in um, representation of uh the the female codependencies and uh, their relationships and how that itself can be a horrific thing within itself and in, in these kinds of uh, 
situations uh, survival mode in a way. But uh, this this it, this was a definitely an interesting watch, and I I would say for anyone to give this one a shot if they're into. Um, uh, Nick mentioned uh, Guillermo del Toro. Huge, I'm a huge fan of his work and very proud to know that he's from uh, my dad's side of the family's hometown, uh, well, home state, the tequila state of Jalisco. But uh, in comparison of the works is just that he, he and this director have in common is that they they put their characters in situations of vulnerable environmental eras and challenging what is supernatural or fantastical in their own way to is it an escape or how to survive so um yeah yeah uh, i'd say give this a go <laughs> yeah yeah I, absolutely it's also on, it's on hbo max right now as we're recording and also the criterion channel as far as streaming uh, but it is still available on a criterion uh dvd Nick, any last uh, comments about the film? Did you get your did you get your final comments in? I think I have my final comments in. I'm just glad to hear um, Whitney make such um, an eloquent final statement there because I feel exactly the same way. I mean, look, you know, as as, as an English guy, you know, as, as it, I'm really interested in seeking um, different cultures. And, mm-hmm. um, and different different ways of telling stories, not for this, not just for the deliberate element of it. It's just you just tend to find that different people from different parts of the world have different ways of telling stories, and they are so fascinating. And it, you know, you, it's it's really interesting to get embroiled into a different culture because the the, the technique yeah. of storytelling is different. It's not first act, second act, third act. It's not boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy, you know, it's not this kind of <laughs> typical formula. When you go to Japanese or Korean or Mexican or Spanish storytelling, you get something different. You just get something raw. And right. it, 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 it's not a product. And, 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 and I think this is what we're looking at here. This is something that is just a different culture, a different time, which is telling a very interesting story. And it just, and that, and it, you know, it, it the reason why Quentin Tarantino was such a, a blast in the night is because he, he he operated outside the studio system, but there is so many people in different countries operating outside the studio system, mm-hmm. just telling different stories. It's not difficult. You know, it's not a difficult yeah. proposition. You just have to, you know, cast the net, widen, you know, widen the net, cast the net, you know, look a little bit beyond your boundaries and you know, prepare to give something a chance. And to me, quite often lately, it, I am I, I don't rush towards films with subtitles, but I seem to find that the most interesting films are the ones with the foreign voice because those foreign voices have got different stories. They've got great stories, right. and you know, they're not they're not they're not formula. And and this is why people like Guillermo del Toro is my favorite director. Why Denis Villeneuve is my second favorite director because these people are coming from different um, different cultures and different points of view, and it's I think it's fantastic. I think we need to look at these. You know, th- this is where you're going to find um, new inspirational stories. You know, and, and and you can find these new inspirational stories in 1964 Japan. Just look outside the you know just to look outside the boundaries is what I'm trying to say. Right. I like watching films from different cultures, too, because partly because of their different way of storytelling and and different visuals and styles, but also the different cultures and family dynamics. So Whitney's watching this coming from a different, right, a culture with a different family dynamic. We're watching, you know, we're all looking at with our own uh, basis and and, uh, trying to discern uh, where the director is coming from on this. All right. We actually, I, you know, guys, uh, this is a long episode, but I actually did get some comments together. So, uh, if you hang with me and they're some pretty good comments. So first off, we have a comment from Andy L 
on episode 75 and episode 81, The Comedy of Terrors and Mad Love, relating to Peter Lorre. He says, I'm catching up slowly on back episodes. Having just done Comedy of Terrors and Mad Love episode episodes, I thought you would enjoy this. My mother, prior to her marriage in the early 1940s, worked as a secretary for the William Morris Agency in New York City. They handled a lot of major talent at that time and still are a major force in the industry today. She told me various stories of her time there, but my two favorites were her being chased around her desk by Harpo Marx, (laughs) (laughs) horn tooting, and this one about Peter Lorre. She was on her lunch break and reading a pulp mystery novel when suddenly she hears in his unmistakable voice, excuse me, can you please tell me the way to the restroom? Upon hearing this voice, while in the midst of a tense portion of the book, she screamed and threw the book up in the air and ran out of the office. (laughs) I I always imagined that Peter Lorre was rather surprised and disappointed with her reaction, but it still always brings a smile to my face. Uh, And then he closes with, thank you for the continued output of entertaining hours of listening. Thank you, Andy. And I actually think Laurie might have laughed about that because he had apparently quite a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I should have had Chad read the Laurie quote. (laughs) Or or, or, uh, uh, I have to pee. Actually. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Andy. And I, I've had some, you know, Andy's turned me on to some good deals uh, when they're on sale at like uh, uh, online that I've picked up at the adventures of uh, Robin Hood was one. All right. We also have one for episode 83, The Incredible Shrinking Man from Dallas Nostromo, another oh, regular listener. He says, just listen to the podcast on The Incredible Shrinking Man. And I, I, no, it's a typo. He meant shrinking man, but I had no one Dallas as, is probably was. Not a typo. <laughs> incredible uh-huh. shirking man. And remember being terrified when he fought the spider. I also really enjoyed Ralph Miller's insight into how some of the special effects were done. Great episode and keep up the great work. Thank you, Dallas. Excellent. Uh, and then on uh, our YouTube channel, Jeremiah, the Pisces commented on the shrinking man episode This is so soothing. I actually fell asleep listening to this. Nice to y'all whoreheads feel like family. Oh. I said, well, you know, our listeners feel like family too. Um, I think it was a positive comment. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on what his family's like, I guess. Uh, I guess, yeah. (laughs) And then I've got two about Curse of the Werewolf. One is from Greg Miller from Australia. And he says, uh, I hope this gets through. I don't know about mentioning other podcasts covering similar grounds, but there's a monthly podcast, Hammer House of Podcast, that covers Hammer's horror movies in order of release. It's two people, one a writer of uh, novels, audio plays, comics, and TV, who's a bit snooty and upper class. (laughs) The other, a Scottish feminist and super Cushing fan, uh, who also writes, and their differences and minor conflicts is part of what makes a podcast. They also have a Patreon uh, stream that covers mostly non-Hammer British horrors. It may or may not be of interest to you guys for a different take and possibly to help with research. Uh, always looking for good places for research and okay. uh, hear other people talking movies. Yeah. Right. So thanks to Greg from Australia. And lastly, this kind of comes from Alistair Hughes about the Curse of the Werewolf, episode 84, uh, which he was on. And a friend of his, Richard Clemenson, sent him a note. And it turns out that Dick Clemenson is editor of a Hammer magazine, Little Shop of Horrors, uh, the Journal of Classic British Horror Films. So he kind of specializes in Hammer, but he also has, like, I've, I've got an issue in my hand right now on the Blood Beast Terror. So... Uh, he, he strays from there, but, and, and he gave, he's, he's where, uh, Al got some of his, uh, information from, and he has had some artwork in the, in the magazine. Dick also has recorded a series of Blu-ray extras for new hammer films on the men of hammer. And, uh, so he's done pieces on Terrence Fisher, Roy Ashton, 
and uh, actually knew a lot of them as he lived in England for a while. But right now, Dick is living in Iowa. And what Dick wrote to Al was very entertaining. I liked that it wasn't just like I might have done, a recitation of facts and figures, but some really good personal insight. Getting the young lady to talk about the different shades of hair color at the end was a plus, as she didn't have the background on curse you other three guys had. I wonder where in Iowa, <laughs> I wonder where in Iowa Jeff lives. In a way, we are all in the middle of a cornfield. Well, it turns out Dick lives in Des Moines, which is about 50 miles from me. So I've connected with him electromagically and picked up some issues of that magazine. And that is an unbelievable magazine with unbelievably small print. It's like eight point font. <laughs> and so they're like 100 pages and 80,000 words. It's just, it's incredible. <laughs> Each magazine is a book. And uh, so I picked up one on Curse of the Werewolf and, and some of the newer ones. So this is a great guy to deal with. And uh, we're going to hook up sometime when it's safe to, to hook up again, right? <laughs> all right. That's all the feedback. Thank you so much, Al. Um, yeah, you can go to littleshopofhorrors.com, I think, and it's spelled S-H-O-P-P-E. So uh, if you want to order uh, any of those magazines. Awesome. Well, Guru Believers, that's it for this episode. But every two weeks we'll be focusing on a specific film released between 1920 and 1920, signed 29 1920 and 19, uh, 1996. <laughs> 1584, the Battle of 1812. <laughs> Four, 14th century films from Japan, yes. Uh, so, films released between 1920 and 1969. Next up, chosen by another super secret listener guest host, is The Innocents from 1961, which is based on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And uh, our guest host said they chose this because of the timing of Mike Flanagan's Netflix production of The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is also loosely based on The Turn of the Screw. Mm -hmm. So we'll look forward to that. Plenty of ways to stay in touch with us. Please send feedback to feedback at gruesomemagazine.com or you can leave comments on the uh, Facebook group, Gruesome Magazine's HNR and DOH podcast Facebook group or the website gruesomemagazine.com. Uh, leave a review at iTunes, and please visit our YouTube channel, the Gruesome Magazine YouTube channel. I think roughly 75% of the podcasts are video now. Maybe this one and Decades of Horror, the 80s, are the only ones that aren't video yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, check those out. Uh, Nick, it has been awesome. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate you picking this film and the uh, effort you put into the research. Thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure. It's been great to be inside the podcast <laughs> for once and not outside it. It's awesome having you here, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, guys. It was so good. So say good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Night, night. Good night, everybody. Tati, when? <laughs> <laughs>